I'm Jana Morgan Herman, and I am here with Letty Rising, and we are going to talk to you about storytelling as a, a part of Montessori education. Uh, I am a parent and grandparent of Montessori children. My husband is a Montessori teacher. His name is Kyle Herman. My children both work at Montessori schools, and my grandchildren both attend Montessori schools. And I was a classroom teacher for over 20 years and then a school director. And, and now I'm a teacher educator. So I'm happy to be here with you today. Letty, introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Letty Rising and I am Montessori trained at the six to 12 level. I have been a teacher, I have been a head of school, I have been a consultant, I've done some uh, training for different schools and organizations. And I also um, have been, have homeschooled my own children and worked as an education specialist at a charter school that serves homeschooling students. And in fact, I'm right now, um, had just created a homeschooling charter school program in California that I'm helping to launch um, as we speak. And so Jenna and I are here today and we're going to be talking about storytelling, as she said, and she is going to be talking about storytelling at the three to six level. And I'll be talking about storytelling at the elementary level, the elementary version. Meanwhile, now um, uh, we're going to have Jana get started talking about the three to six age. So go ahead, Jana. Take All it right. Over. Storytelling has been a part of human existence for as long as there have been humans. Humans have communicated to each other through storytelling. They've passed on their histories. Before there were books, people told stories to each other so that they could remember what happened in the families um, and in the histories that came before them. We can still use storytelling in very important ways. Obviously now books are so available for children that we want them, we want them to have exposure to as many wonderful books as, as possible. However, storytelling is going to be an important part of how you can help your child connect with emotions or difficult situations, how they can process things. You can expose them to feelings or people that they might not have con come in contact with on their own. We're gonna be focusing on how we can make those stories interesting and what Montessori says about those stories. Let me tell you first that before we get into storytelling for children, uh, it's important to recognize that a, a really important part of storytelling is dramatic play. Because when children are using dramatic play, they are telling a story. They are acting out the story that they have in their heads. And this is a natural part of the development. It is a mistaken idea that Montessori says that there is no room for this in the three to six level. That's just not true. And if you read the 1946 London Lectures, which was written, of course, toward the end of her life, you see exactly how she feels about that. And I'm going to talk more about that. But first, I want to go back to dramatic play and, and talk to you about how at first, with dramatic play, children use representational props, and then they have to, they can use less and less representational props. So that at first, they might have a baby doll, but they can pretend later that the, for instance, the largest knob cylinder and the smallest knob cylinders are the mom and the baby. And that is normal. Now, what we try to do in a, in a three to six classroom is that we make sure that when we're observing that they have this need, that they are storytelling like this, that we provide opportunities for that. So we're not gonna go over and stop them when they're working. That's just telling us that they have reached that level Level of imaginative play and we're going to foster that. Let's see what Montessori says about, about uh, imagination. She says, man's intelligence is imaginative. We must not think of a passive receptive mind but of a creative constructive mind in which at every point something is being created internally. And when children are playing, this is how we, we, see, we see what they are thinking inside. Montessori says that there are factors of intelligence. And the first factor of intelligence is activity, which we are well familiar with, that children are, are very active. And that shows us about their intelligence. She says, this follows certain laws and allows the child to construct intelligence from his experience. Lillard calls this, calls this process embodied cognition, that they are constructing their intelligence from their experiences, from moving and acting in the environment. And Montessori says the child constructs his intelligence through his experience. But she says the second and greater factor of intelligence is imagination. 
Among all animals, only man possesses this gift, and it's a gift which lasts throughout his life, and it is not a sensitivity particular to one special period that then disappears. And so what she's saying is that this is a sensitive period, like other sensitive periods, but it's different in that it doesn't go away. So if you feel like you're not imaginative, or if you feel like you've lost that creative spirit, take heart because you haven't. It's still there. You just need to start focusing on it again and develop it, and it will, it will reveal itself. The same is true for children. This is something that does not pass. However, we have to be careful that we don't damp it down with the way that we have a tendency to redirect them to what we might call more purposeful activity. Don't do that because this intelligence is a part of, we see it with imagination. She says, the greatest use of imagination is that it enables us to see the things that are not in front of our eyes. This, she says, is human's greatness. She says that actually this period is the special period for the construction of imagination. This is in the child up to age six. And that children illustrate this power by the fact that they love stories so much. She talks about how children at three and four years of age love to hear the same story over and over and over and over again. They love it. And th what they are practicing is this ability to construct an image in their mind. And it is a very important part of work. So any time that we can tell children stories and then they want to hear those stories over and over again, we can repeat them. We need to make space to repeat them. And, and so everything you've told them in that storytelling activity, everything that you've told them is something that they're going to imprint on. And I, I want to say too that this is different from reading a book. When you are uh, showing them a book, so lots of children's books at three to six has pictures and those pictures are fine, but just know that when you focus on showing them those pictures, instead of just learning that story and telling them the story, that they lose that, that little gift about being able to imagine what they see in their heads. That is actually the gift. That's a big gift. So yes, read those great story books, but also just learn those stories and tell them those stories. Montessori says that they love to hear these stories repeated over and over again, rather than hearing new ones. And she says, I think this is interesting, that this corresponds to the repetition of the exercises on the physical plane. So just like they like to repeat the same materials over and over again, the, the, same, the same process is happening mentally when we repeat those stories over and over again. She said, therefore, during this initial period, we see the same phenomena of repetition. And the fact that children derive such pleasure from this shows us that there is an activity going on in the mind around which something is developing, which is being constructed. She says that this is a primitive phenomena and that this gives rise to pick the same kind of pleasure that pictures give on the sensorial level because they are visualizing it. Montessori goes on to talk about, and I'm sure that you're familiar with this, uh, common stories that children love are stories like the three little bears, which, you know, there are some issues with the three little bears, <laughs> but they love the fact that there's a struggle and there's something to be overcome and there's a resolution at the end. So even though so I know for in my classroom and with my children for a very long time I didn't have any animals that dressed up and if an animal couldn't do it in real life then I didn't have it in a book and I am not that same way with my grandson because this is what I found to be true that what Montessori said I found to be true is that they know what a bear is and they know what a house is and they can imagine a bear in a house so what what we do see is that children can can handle this really well when it is based on reality. And that's different than, than fantasy that they can't abstract, that they can't understand why it happens. But at this level, they can understand, for instance, one of the things she mentions is fairies because they've seen women and they've seen, for instance, dragonflies. They can put those two images together and they can imagine what a fairy might look like. Those are constructions of the imagination. And while, while we want to provide space for that, and we can use that in stories, we also want to make sure that we're balancing that with real experiences. So because, you know, as Montessori said, if we go too far the other way, then children kind of get lost in that idea of fantasy and they do not, they are not grounded in the reality that is going to benefit them. So that when children are pretending with things, if they're pretending to serve people things, for instance, if they're using something that is not related to food, then what we can do is in the future, we know, oh, I can show them how to do this food 
food prep activity, and they can actually have a tea party where they serve real tea. They might still have their baby dolls there, they might have their imaginary friends there, but they're actually doing an activity that's based in reality. And there is benefit in that, and we want to make sure that we support it. Montessori said that when we do this, that we find that children have, quote, a mental calmness comes when a child is able to complete a construction of the imagination. And we see this all the time with drawing. With drawing is also a form of storytelling. And we're going to help children understand that, you know, when they are acting something out or when they are pretending, that is telling a story. So you could ask them later, oh, tell me about that story you were telling earlier. Tell me what happened next in that story. So you're going to have them see themselves as authors. You're going to have them see themselves as people who are in control of what happens next. And the same thing is true with their drawing. Having them, if they're able to, write out the things that they're, or sound out in whatever ways that they can, what they're drawing. Or we can take dictation. So they can, you can say, tell me the story of this, and you can write on the back. I always write in cursive, but you could write in print if you want to. I always write on the back. So tell me what happened first in this story. Who are the characters in this story? So you're getting them to describe it and you are naming for them these aspects of the story, which is going to lay the groundwork as Montessori and Mario said, for what's gonna come next with storytelling in elementary for the elementary age child. At this point, they're using their imagination to construct and they are going to see themselves as authors. And then on the flip side, what you're going to do is model what storytelling is. So you're going to have patterns that you tell in stories. So you can help set the stage for a story like Once Upon a Time or something similar that's kind of a gateway to let children know that you're about to begin telling a story. Or you could say, I'm going to tell you a real story or I'm going to tell you an imaginary story. And that's one of the things that I learned from Marlene Barron is just to, when you're talking about storytelling, is just to differentiate because children believe what we say, especially in our little sphere of reality in Montessori classrooms, children believe us. And so we need to specify if this is a real story or an imaginary story. And then children can, uh, you know, after that become a partner with you. So let's tell a real story. What do you want to tell? Do you want to tell a story about what happened yesterday or last week or when we went camping? And then you can do the same thing with an imaginary story. And if you have a number of children there, you can work on that story together and then you can document what it is and fold it into a book. For some children their storytelling might be as simple as drawing one person on a page and then they tell you who that person is. Um, and you can do the same thing when you're doing sound books or when you're writing in all aspects. So you can do this when you're talking about numbers. You can do this when you're using sounds to put together three and four letter phonetic words. You can put sentences together that are phonetic to tell a story so that when children read those, they are visualizing that as well. One of my favorite things to do is to take stories and help children go through the three, what I call the three, the three steps of storytelling and acting which is at first I will tell them a story and the story that I like to tell is Mortimer. Letty do you know the book Mortimer? Yeah. I love it so much. It is one of my favorite books and it is by Robert Munch and he actually worked with children and what he did was uh, he would go home and write these stories and then he would come in and read these stories to children and if the children never asked for the story again he never told it again and the the books that he wrote the books that you can read in the store are all books that children ask for over and over again and they all speak to people in real situations people who love each other who might even fuss or deal with some problem and then they overcome that problem and they all respect each other and love each other. And I think it speaks to the power of these stories, how children want to hear them. And if you, when you are telling a story, it is really important that you are engaging. So if you are just reading a story and your voice is flat and your affect is flat, that is not going to be a story that kind of elicits or draws this relationship with children about the story. You need to make sure that your that your eyes and your face and your voice, everything about you is telling the story too, as if it really happened. And that's going to help them connect with it. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to tell you my version of the story of Mortimer. And just very frankly, I memorized the story probably almost 30 years ago. So I don't tell it exactly 
<laughs> like it is in the book, but that's okay. And I'm, I'm really comfortable with the way I tell it. And you can do the same thing too. If there are stories that have words maybe that you don't like or situations that you want to change, guess what? You're an author. You can do that. You can tell the story however you want. And that is fine. And that's what, that's what I do. So with Mortimer, I say, okay, join me for a story. I'm going to tell you a story. Come and have a seat. And when people are sitting there, I say, this story is called Mortimer, and it's by Robert Munch. He's the author. He's the person who wrote the words. And it's illustrated by Michael Marchenko. He's the illustrator. That's the person who draws the picture that go with the story. Here's the story. Are you ready? Okay. One night, Mortimer's mother took him upstairs to go to bed. Thump, 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 thump. She opened the door to his room. She threw him into bed and said, Mortimer, be quiet. <laughs> Mortimer shook his head. Yes. His mother closed the door and went back down the stairs. Thump, thump, thump. As soon as she got to the bottom of the stairs, Mortimer sang, Clean, clean, rada bing, bing, got to make my noise all day. Well, downstairs, Mortimer's father heard that noise, and he came up the stairs. Thump, 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 thump. He opened the door to his room and said, Mortimer, be quiet. <gasps> Mortimer shook his head. Yes. The father closed the door and went back down the stairs. As soon as he got to the bottom of the stairs, Mortimer saying, cling, cling, bada, bing, bang, gonna make my noise all day. Cling, gonna bing, bang, gonna make my noise all day. Well, downstairs, Mortimer's 17 brothers and sisters heard all that noise, and they all came up the stairs. They opened the door to his room and yelled in tremendously loud voices, Mortimer, be quiet. <sighs> Mortimer shook his head. Yes, the 17 brothers and sisters closed the door and went back down the stairs. As soon as they got to the bottom of the stairs, Mortimer sang, Cling, cling, bada bing, bang, gonna make my noise all day. Cling, cling, bada bing, bang, gonna make my noise all day. Well, downstairs, no one knew what to do. So they called someone over. It was the police. Two policemen came over and they walked very slowly up the stairs. Thump, 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 thump. They opened the door to his room and said in very deep policeman type voices, Mortimer, be quiet. <gasps> Mortimer shook his head yes. They closed the door and went back down the stairs. Thump, 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 thump. As soon as they got to the bottom of the stairs, Mortimer sang, Clean, clean, better be gonna make my noise all day. Clean, clean, better be gonna make my noise all day. Well, downstairs, no one knew what to do. The father got into a big angry talk with the 17 brothers and sisters, and the mother got into a big angry talk with the police officers. And upstairs, oh, Mortimer got so tired waiting on someone to come up that he fell asleep. The end. And that is the end of the first story. Now, children relate to this. They all want their parents to come back in the room. They try the oldest tricks in the book, the I have to go to the bathroom again, or the I need water again, or can I just kiss you one more time? They all relate to this. And so they love this story. Now, obviously, in this day and age, I would probably change it from policemen. 
because there's a lot going on and certain people are definitely going to be more uncomfortable with the police, with the idea of the police coming into their house than others. So I would change that now. You might want it to be um, a grandparent or somebody who carries a lot of authority in your child's life. Uh, maybe it's a downstairs or an upstairs neighbor from an apartment who's scary or maybe. Uh, so I would definitely modify that part. But what, so we tell that and I tell that every day for maybe a couple of weeks. And then after I tell that story every day for a week at least, then I am going to invite the children to act it out while I narrate it. So I'm stepping out. So this is like the equivalent of the second period where they are going to act out the story. They all know this story by now and they're going to act out the story. And then, uh, and everybody gets to be any part. It doesn't matter. We do it many days in a row and every person can be every part. So you as a parent, especially if you, um, you have to figure out how you can make it so that children can act this out. So if you have one child, you might have stuffed animals that act out the other parts or you might have everybody in the family take a part the only way that that will happen is that if you demonstrate that this is a really fun thing to do so they will follow your lead on it so really get in there and make it happen mm -hmm. all children love to hear stories about people when they were little and i think that whenever we can do that whenever we can hone some stories to tell them they really do love to hear the same ones over and over again but that you can also make it up. You know, if you, if all your memories aren't great, you can, <laughs> you can use your imagination. Well, and to uh, jump into what you're saying there, Jana, is uh, elementary children in particular really love hearing stories about times when their parents made a mistake. And it's actually, you know, a really great exercise for them because it helps them also learn how to own mistakes themselves and, and be okay with them. And so, you know, if you're like, let me tell you about a story. Let me tell you a story about a time when I made a really huge mistake when I was around your age. And they find that really validating. They can empathize with you. I mean, storytelling actually increases empathy in children. You know, I agree. Yeah. Uh, listening to stories, learn, you know, just really getting inside the story does a lot to increase empathy. And helping them foresee what will happen. So pausing, like if you're starting to read a chapter book, saying, what do you think is going to happen next? Or sometimes just asking them, what do you think just happened? Because children, if you are reading a book that is over their head, they only get what they're capable of understanding and exposed to at that time. An example, and I'm not suggesting that people do this, but an example is that when I was in elementary school, my mom read to me To Kill a Mockingbird, which I'm, I'm very glad that she did, but I had no idea what really happened in that story. I was able to relate to Scout because I was like Scout. And so I'm here with Scout and the biggest struggle in that whole book for me was when she was in the ham in the woods and she got, her brother was being hurt and she was stuck in the ham. And so, um, you know, so if, if somebody had asked me what that story was about, that's what I would have told them. So remember too, that they may be getting something different. So asking them, what do you think about what happened? What just happened there? And when things are uncomfortable, having them, you can, they can stop and process it. You know, I remember when my children were in elementary school, they did not, that was reading, what was the Lemony Snicket? Do you remember when those books oh, were yeah. so popular? Yeah. And I just thought they were great. You know, I just thought they were great. And, but my children, like I said, we didn't watch movies, you know, they didn't, they didn't have a lot of exposure to things that weren't real and certainly to things that were violent. They had no, we did not do violence. And I remember we were listening to that book on tape and my daughter said, can you please turn this off? I'm not comfortable listening to this, you know? And I was like, okay, thank you for telling me, you know, here I am like driving down the road, listening to the <laughs> story of them and he's snicket, imagining it all in my head. And for them, they just, you know, they just have a different experience. So what you love as a book might not be something that children love to listen to. And they might love hearing other kinds of stories, you know, and, and, and we have to take that into consideration. We want them to be the best that they can be and, and, and grow their potentialities, you know, for whatever those are. And that might and be different. Another than fun thing you can do in elementary to extend it too is, you know, when you finish a book, say, would you have ended this story differently? And if you would have, like, tell a different ending to the story. I'm curious to how you would like it to end instead. And then that's 
that's them practicing their storytelling skills. And I know that a lot of families are distance learning right now for homeschooling. And if, you know, hopefully teachers are getting on there and having kids tell stories and give presentations to each other because practicing telling a story and listening to story, they're, they're both really high level high order thinking skills that you, you know, the children benefit a lot from. It's a very complex process to be able to uh, tell a story from beginning to end. Yes, I totally agree with that. I, I think that's great. I think that's a great idea. I think at three to six, they love hearing stories and you could certainly having them acting out what they think, you know, or drawing what they think this, this person or thing looks like. So many, so many ways that you can go with that. Thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time.